This is a deep technical conversation. This is on the advanced track for uh, cloud infrastructure and management. I'm going to be talking about what we put together for VMware to use internally for cloud to enable the sales force. So I'm not going to have a lot of opportunity to uh, you know, describe terminology that I'm using. I, I'm going to have to assume that everyone's OK with how vSphere works, how vCloud Director works, how vShield Manager works, how Vue works. I can't take the time to describe those. I'm going to be building on that understanding and going up from there. Uh, there will be a Q&A opportunity at the end of the conversation. I also have a short kind of show and tell demo. So I'll be able to show you live what it is I'm talking about here. But for the most part, we're here to talk about an advanced cloud deployment that is very real and very live that we're working with inside the business right now. We call it the virtual SE lab now, the virtual sales enablement cloud. All right, so let's get started. A little bit of a disclaimer right up front. Most of what I'm telling you is true. Some of the things are lies, but I won't tell you which ones are which. It's up to you to figure out. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, let me go ahead and read this. Uh, may contain product features that are currently under development. Actually, this is all built out of 2011 products, so this is all going to be stuff that's shipping this year. Uh, uh, new technology represents no commitment from VMware, blah, 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 blah. Uh, features are subject to change, especially some of the things that are more advanced that I'm going to be talking about here. We're using features that actually don't exist from a public point of view. I'll tell you about those. Um, uh, technical feasibility and market demand will affect final delivery, pricing and packaging for any new technologies or features discussed and presented, so on and so on and so forth. Also, I hope you brought an umbrella because it's going to be raining cold, hard facts in here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I know it's 8 in the morning. <laughs> to tell the story of vCell, I really have to start at the beginning. And I'm going to pick up speed through the presentation because I have got about 40 minutes to tell this entire cloud story so I can spend 10 minutes showing it to you so we can spend 10 minutes having Q&A. So it's going to feel like I'm flying. Sorry, we've got a lot to cover. In the beginning, we had to solve for this problem. This is a photo from Hans. This is what technical resources within VMware were issued in the earlier days of the company in order to be able to work with our product set. You were given a laptop, you were given a big black server that you could put underneath your desk, and this is how you learned our product set. It was great when installing ESX was mostly what we sold five years ago. That is really no longer the case, right? So what came after it was this. Another of Hans. Hans, raise your hand. Everyone knows Hans Bernhardt. What came after it was this. It was called the SEVDC. It was essentially a small stack of servers and storage that had sort of a schedule metaphor around it, which said, we're going to set up these ESX servers in storage in a particular way for a particular use. And if you need it, go into a group calendar and schedule some time to log in remotely to it, originally using some other remote desktop technology, eventually ours that you could use this kit for a couple of hours, and when you're done, we would reset the entire thing by scrubbing all the disks and re-imaging it. Is that about right? Didn't scale, but it was a good answer for the beginning. So we had to solve for these sorts of problems in an, in an environment, in a, in a group that was growing very rapidly. I think when this was out there, we were about 5,000 people at VMware. We're, we're north of 16,000 now. That wreck of stuff isn't going to get us to the future, right? So we had to solve for these sorts of problems. So a project was born about three years ago to come up with a better answer to how to enable field-based, sales-oriented, customer-facing technical resources to be able to make use of our product, show our product, learn it without having to take a week off to go to school or whatever, and be able to use it on an ad hoc basis whenever it was available or whenever they needed it for it to be available. And so we put together a project team and we came up with what we call the Virtual SC Lab. That project was violently successful. And what it was built out of was vSphere 4.0 and Lab Manager and... Um, a bunch of little sands that we were able to get our hands on. And what it allowed us to do was a couple of really important things. 
It allowed us to create a model by which the capacity that people were consuming was a fully shared model. Anyone could log into Lab Manager at any time and touch the resources they wanted to touch and get it, you know, make configurations and put them out on the disk and you weren't crushing anybody else's stuff. And we put Vue in front of it and it was a very cooperative, shared kind of model. In fact, it felt sort of cloud-like. Self-service, web UI, easy entry point, uh, you know, a sort of multi-tenancy in that whatever you built didn't take away from what someone else built and so on. That was great. It lasted for a couple of years, but eventually started to kind of run out of gas. It was built on Lab Manager, and Lab Manager was coming to an end. We knew this. It was built on one giggy networking, and that can only go really so far. You know, your storage is only so fast. And as the company started to grow, demand for this became, uh, it began to outstrip our ability to grow this platform fast enough. So... What we did was start a new project. My boss phoned me up and he said, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to need for you to uh, you know, do vSell again this year. Is that cool? And I was like, woo <laughs> new vSell, let's do it. And so what we did was put together a solution that's based around 2011 cloud product, this year's stuff, not last year's stuff. So vSell, the virtual sales enablement cloud, is a 2011 cloud based off of our reference architecture, our implementation. If you've never looked at our reference architecture, it's a set of documents that we publish on the website. If you go to Cloud Director product page, there's a couple of tabs at the bottom, and one of them is resources, and there's that one. And I think we just published the 2.0 version of the reference architecture this morning. This is that put to work. It is also, from the field's point of view, a no charge to them infrastructure as a service cloud that they can gain access to whenever they need to. It is essentially their IaaS in their back pocket that they can leverage whenever they need to, should they be uh, needing to have a look at a product or out there uh, in front of a customer or putting together a proof of concept or whatever it may be. It is also an internal reservoir of all these labs that you can go take over at Hands-On Labs right now. We're going to copy all that content in. It wasn't built inside vSail. It was built in another cloud, and we're going to move it cloud to cloud so that any of the staff that are inside VMware can go and take those labs whenever they want to just by logging into vSail and going for it. It is a reference not only for us, but for the folks that wrote all this software. I can't tell you how many times I've had uh, devs that are working on these products phone me up and say, how's it going in vSail? And I'm like, well, why don't you check it out? Here's some credentials. Log into cloud. I can put you in a particular org. You can set up whatever monitors you want and turn them back on the cloud itself and watch it. It's yours. It, you know, it's cloud. You don't need me. There's minimum administrative overhead when it comes to cloud. Just log in and get, give it a go. And they love that because it's a big world. It's a busy system. And they love having one right inside that they can look at. Uh, it's also Carl's cloud because he asked for one. Everyone heard of Carl Eschenbach? He sponsored this cloud. So he said, actually, the story goes that in the cafe that's in this building, the one that's kind of down here by the waterfall, I was sitting down there with a couple of guys building our strategy around how we were going to attack vCell 2.0, our, our new approach, and Carl Eschenbach walks in. Now, when Carl walks in the room, pretty much everybody notices, right? He's got kind of that aura about him. He's, he's a presence, oddly enough. He walks in, he gets his cup of coffee, and everyone's kind of watching him. He walks back out, and I stand up boldly, and I say, Hi, Carl, I'm building your cloud this year. Now, I don't know if that was a particularly career advancing or retarding moment, but it felt like something I should do. So he shakes my hand, and he says, that's great. Make sure it works. <laughs> and out he goes. So I'm like, okay, I, I'll do just that. So I put a shout-out up there for Carl because he said he wanted one. Uh, it is a grand interoperability test. vCell, among many other things, is a giant pile of dog food, or I should say, a big use of our own products inside our own house for our own people to use, which internally we shorthand as dog fooding. So it is definitely a pile of dog food. Um, it is, interestingly enough, a way for us in the, in the creation side of this, the architecture side, I, I didn't give my title, I'm a cloud architect for VMware, is a way for us to hand cloud over to our entire field globally and say, this is what it's like to live with cloud. We can tell you about it 
in slides all day long. We can show you in presentations. We can do all these things, but there's nothing like trying it, right? So here's a little bit of cloud for you that we've built. And if you don't like the way it works, you know what? You work here. So open a feature request. <laughs> That's OK. OK. I have, to pick, I have to pick up speed here. It's a great place to do training. It's a great place for the cloud specialists uh, to have a little bit of capacity of their own that they can focus on. It's a great place to build intellectual property. If there's ever a place where you wanted to crack open one of our products and poke around inside the menu structure so you can see exactly how we word or, or place things or how they operate, vCell is an exactly great place to do that. Uh, and it's also, uh, selfishly, a great place for me to play with all of our stuff. Uh, I've been doing vCell for about six months now, and it's been a dream because all I get to do all day long is think about ways to take products out of our portfolio and put them to work with each other and see how they go. And for the most part, they go great. All right. I think the first thing I have to talk about when I consider vCell is the fact that in the early starting parts, or starting areas of the project in February timeframe, I had to consider how to frame this project. I was building Carl's Cloud for all of Carl's people, and there were thousands of them globally. And they had a certain requirement, and they had needs, and they had access issues, and they're going to be all over the place, and they're going to be running around. And I had to frame all this up somehow. And it occurred to me that I could go out and build a huge kit and put tons of software online and do all these wonderful things, and I still wouldn't really have a good idea of what it is I'm trying to offer. So I was chatting with Mike DiPagello and a couple other guys, and I said, you know, I want it to do this, and I want it to do that. And he says, well, what do your service definitions say? And I said, well, yeah. what I should do is I should write down the services that I want to offer. Now, I happen to be one of the authors of the original uh, reference architecture. And in that, the first document is called Service Definitions for a blank, 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 private cloud, public cloud, whatever. So I took that document, which is intended to be a template, I scrubbed it all out, and I put my service definitions in there, and they look like this. Service category A is essentially people who work here, trusted and badged, the ones that have the keys. That service category defines a certain set of access that you'll have, a certain type of resource, a certain type of networking, and so on and so forth. With that definition, I could then say, okay, well, those sorts of folks would need to touch this kind of stuff inside vCell and have these kinds of labs and blah, 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 blah while others may not. Service category B was the definition of people that we trust, like our partners, but don't necessarily work here, aren't badged. And that means something very slightly different. That means they can touch the same kind of stuff. They're in, inside our ecosystem. They're part of our community. They don't necessarily need to get back to our HR system. So let's put them on the internet wire rather than the corporate wire. This is something that cloud lets me do because I have multi-tenancy and I can offer one wire or another up to a cloud and the other one simply just isn't there. One set of clouds gets the corporate wire that goes just where they want it to go. Another set of clouds gets the internet wire which goes a completely different direction and they don't have to know about each other. So I can do this. Hard to do in lab manager. Category C is essentially the everybody else category. If you're not an A, you're not really a B, you're probably a C which fits into the, well, you're not trusted because we don't know you, and you're not badged because you don't work here, so that's how we fit that. It was kind of my catch-all category. With these three service definitions, I could now start to frame and shape what it is I wanted to do with this cloud, how I wanted to offer it, the ways that it was going to be consumed. This shaped the entire project. It still does. Merlin Glenn is right over here, and he's been helping me architect the final stages of this. And he and I have arguments, conversations, twice a week about, well, I want the cloud to do this. And I say, well, the service definition says that. So should we reconsider our service definitions, or does it fit? And it's been a framing conversation. I think it's been a very valuable tool. OK. We can't talk about vCell without talking about the payload. Because I said vCell was a reference architecture. It was cloud done the way we say to do cloud. So eh, you know, OK, we went out and built the cloud, super duper. The payload is really what makes it special, makes it unique compared to what you can do with cloud right out of the box. This conversation here at 8.15 in the morning is a deep dive into that specialness. And I'm going to be telling you all sorts of things that hopefully you've never heard before because they're internal. <laughs> but you've come to our show, and you've paid to be here, and I'm going to share something unique with you. So the first one is the payload. This slide actually dates back to the very first vCell, the lab manager one. So you'll see funny things in here about LM and VDI and 
older terminology, but the, the slide or the graphic still tells the story very nicely. If you read it from the bottom up, the first layer is physical. This is your gear that's running ESX, that's running the VMs that frame up the cloud. The second layer are the physical ESX servers that are running the payload. So you need a management cluster on the bottom, and you need a capacity cluster on the top. If you have a look at our reference architecture, we tell you exactly this. When you frame your cloud, a great way to go is to set some capacity aside for running the show, and a different set of capacity, probably the majority of it, for running the payloads of that show. This is that, and on top, we get into some very interesting stuff. And again, it says Lab Manager, but the application is the same. You'll have templates of building blocks of things that you can build out of. What makes vCell unique is that those building blocks will include ESX servers and iSCSI virtual appliances and virtual center virtual appliances and other sorts of things that you would regularly deploy at the first level of virtualization to get the show going. What we do in vCell is build those at the second level so that what you end up with are little sets of configurations in VCD called vApps that are in fact little data centers under themselves, which you can then load more virtualization into on top of. Now, like I said, most of this isn't going to make any sense, but stay with me. One of the points behind vCell is to build payloads that are actually more virtualized data centers that you can run more payloads inside of. Why would you want to do that? Well, first, it's awesome. Second of all, it gives you essentially unlimited access to all the virtualization you could possibly want whenever you want it by turning things on and off. And when you work at a virtualization company, that's just really super valuable. 99% of the time, the people that are here to consume vCell capacity are doing so so they can work with ESX and vCenter Server and vCD and Lab Manager and all these other sort of products up in that second layer. Because the layer below it really sort of ceases to exist. You're not there to work with the cloud. You're, work with, you're there to work with what the cloud has given you in the way of a configuration which might actually be another cloud. So how do we do it? We did it this way. This is the first graphic I put together to try and explain to my boss what it is I think we need to get away with here with vCell. I'm going to switch to the crazy green laser pointer and say, the way to look at this is that at the bottom, there are three essentially islands of cloud being depicted here. I've got a uh, EMEA and US and APJ cloud. You've got your compute capacity, you've got your management cluster, just like the reference architecture says. And on top of that, I've got sort of these cloud bubbles. And in there, I've got one, two, three types of cloud that will be offered from each of these islands. One of them is private, service category A. One of them is semi-private, service category B. And one of them is a public type, service category C. After writing the service definitions, this diagram put itself together. It was easy. I knew what I was trying to do. I was trying to offer these three things. And if so, I need to offer these, and I need to put this together. I need one of these, and I need some of that. Done. Easy. Went real quickly. You can see I haven't revised this one in forever <laughs> because I don't need to. It fits the model. It suits. We're in good shape. Um, one, two, three regions. Your payload's right up here. You've got catalogs that are common across all of them, and the access mode for comes right in on the cloud. We are uh, deployed in North America right now. We're going to turn this guy loose on the uh, a suspecting public later this month, and then we're going to grow out to EMEA and APJ probably early next year. And when we do that, we'll need to set up a little bit of orchestration that helps us move these catalogs around, but essentially this vision will come to fruition. This is the 50,000-foot level, if you will. This graphic was a bit big, but I think it came out okay. This is, so go back. These columns are my three islands. If I drill down into one of those columns, I need one of these. On the left is my management cluster that runs the whole show, and you can see I've got all kinds of services lifted up there. One of the things that we do in vCell is everything that needs to run is running a VM. There is no physical hardware there doing any job other than virtualization, 100%. I actually worked with a vendor, and I'll have a slide on them a little later, that said, you know, we only deploy on physical. And I said, you do what? <laughs> what what, what did you say? Well, we, you know, we usually have three or four servers you deploy on physical. I was like, what? What are you talking about? Can you do it in a VM? I was like, what? Well, we never tried. I said, great. Here are three VMs. Go for it. So 
we got our management cluster on the left, we got our cloud payload clusters in the center, and on the right, of course, we have our orgs. The idea here is that I can organize my blade set into sets of capacity down that center column. I deploy them into sets of 16. You can see 16 uh, in a cluster, maximum of 32. It's a vCenter limit. 16, 16, and 16 at the bottom, I got a nice little cluster set aside for a different kind of um, allocation model. As I'm sure you guys are all aware, I warned you at the beginning of the talk, I can't explain all these constructs, but you're all aware that there are three allocation models uh, available in vCloud Director, uh, Res and Alloc and Pago. Uh, what most of vCell is biased toward a Pago model, where um, you have uh, uh, everyone is uh, such a peers or equal, or it's free swim. As long as there's room in the pool, feel free to jump in. And I've got a little bit of allocation pool on the side, which says that if you have something that needs to run pretty much all the time, Spring is a great example. They run a demo server for Hyperic that just stays up 24-7. They could touch it from the outside world. That's a great thing for that little allocation pool at the bottom. It could just stay on all the time. So this is how we go, and you draw from the capacity out into the orgs. This construct is actually intended to show what I think is one of the most powerful and interesting features of uh, vCloud Director 1.5. Again, I'm building on 2011 product. 1.5 is going to ship at the show, I think, this week. Uh, and that is the Elastic PVDC. You can see I've got my PVDC construct stretched across those three resource pools. For folks that have played with uh, vCloud Director to date, you know that you really have to stack a PVDC on top of a resource pool and an OVDC on top of that, and you put your cloud on top of that, and you end up with these kind of tall stacks. Uh, in 1.5, we have Elastic PVDCs, which lets you stretch one PVDC across multiple resource pools. You can't leave a VC, but you can do that. So what I have here are three resource pools of 16 blades each organized into one PVDC, which gives me a very interesting thing. It allows me to build on a 50% rule. All of my clusters can be half full in case I need to scale up. I can add more clusters in case I want to scale out, and I can always build for that need. And my boundary stops being the cluster and starts being the virtual center. That is my upper limit for how, build, how big I can resource a provider VDC. So that's exactly what I do. Lots to do. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, I probably have a few gearheads in the room, so I'm going to talk about the gear for a little bit. I'm a gearhead. I like this stuff, too. We can't stay in the clouds forever. Uh, this is what it's built out of. Largely Cisco UCS, uh, next generation product, half with blades, B200s. And uh, we've got, oddly enough, um, that many chassis, 15, not 16. Uh, we ran out of money, so we got 15. And they're organized roughly this way. What this graphic is really intended to show is that we took the physical gear and we organized it into a set of virtual centers. So this cluster of goodies comes up into the green line. We have a couple of clusters that come out of it, 16, 16, 16, and two should be, not four. And this cluster of stuff organized into these resource pools. And this stuff over here is not Cisco. So what's it doing there? Remember I mentioned early on vCell.now, which is what I call it, our current vCell that was built a couple years ago, was built out of HP, half high blades, and uh, EMC and NetApp storage. That stuff will become defunct when vCell Next goes live at the end of September. So the plan is to take the majority of the stuff that is great, the stuff we like the most out of it, and melt it into vCell Next as a capacity expansion. This gives me a heterogeneous cloud, a multi-vendor cloud, and also gives me lots of interesting ways of sort of saying, well, if you want the diamond class, then you're going to definitely want to be in this capacity. But if it's no big deal and you're OK with the gold class, then you can use these older servers over here. And that's fine. That gives me lots and lots of flexibility about where I can sort of sort people. Someone's going to say, eh, I need my payloads to run a long, long time. Well, you can run them over here, because I don't really care what's happening over there. Let's keep this stuff short. Uh, lots of choices there. And there it is. Mr. Blurrier Cam took a picture for me. Up in, uh, this is stored in our data center that's in Wenatchee, Wenatchee, which is eastern Washington state. And uh, I, I thought it was impressive. Plus, slide decks are more fun with pictures in them. So that's what vCell Next looks like. Um, our storage is just off frame. There's only so much I can get in a frame. So the compute looks like this. Again, for the gearheads in the room, I thought this would be fun. B200 class blades with Nehalem class, uh, specifically Westmere. Uh, chips, uh, six cores on a die with HT times two in a blade gives me 24 effective cores. I am swimming in cores. I am swimming in cores. 
I had a chat with a fellow named Jim Matson, who's a developer here at VMware, who works specifically on the ESX platform, uh, very specifically in the nesting of ESX technology in a VM. This is one of his kind of pets. And he said, well, uh, what, uh, he's a uh, uh, kind of quiet fellow, and he says, what chips did you buy for vCell? And he was very concerned. He had this kind of very concerned look on his face. He said, what chips did you buy? And I said, well, I don't know, Intel. He's like, no, no, no. What chips did you buy? I said, uh, they're in the Halem class, um, something like this. He said, no, no. So this is a developer I'm talking about. He writes machine language. He's like, no, you don't understand. What chips did you buy? I said, Westmere 3.07 gigahertz. I started reeling off the number. He's like, good. Uh, oh, Jim, what are you... What's the deal? He's like, well, you know, Intel has this way where they work on, and I forget the exact term because I'm not a developer, a, a stepping model where how many times we have to dip into the CPU to get instruction taken care of, and it comes back out and it tells the software that it's done and it dips back in. Well, the Westmere is actually the best and the fastest at that, which really benefits your virtualization of ESX because you want as few of those as possible. And if you went to Sandy Bridge, which is a new generation chip, that actually gets two clock steps slower. I'm like, really? <laughs> Okay, well, great. I, I hit the nail on the head without having any idea. So, just so you know, the Westmere chip is what you want if you want to do what we do with vCell at grand scale. Moving on. Uh, we filled every slot in the chassis with an 8 gig DIMM because of the cheap stuff. And it gives us about 98 gigs. It boils down to about 96. There's a certain set of technical trade offs to that, but essentially, we wanted the blade full of memory without spending big money on memory. So, we ended up on that. 15 chaps, he's fully popped, 120 blades total. Uh, VCell.now is actually a C7000 chassis. Uh, with G7 blades, we did a refresh there of uh, AMD based CPUs. And I got to use a very fun term, a dodecacore Magni Coors uh, CPU. How many times do you get to say to your, your wife or your family, I'm using some dodecacore chips today? It's good stuff. 64 gigs of RAM because that's what that blade maxes out at, 8 gigs. And uh, two chassis fully popped gives us 32. So when vCell Next is fully done and we've melted in now into it, we'll have 154 CPU or uh, platforms within, within which to run on. And that is all about eggs in baskets. Yeah, I could have gone with a uh, full height. Yeah, I could have done something with the refresh of the C7000 and done full heights or whatever. I like lots of baskets for my eggs because it gives me lots and lots of freedom for which baskets hold which eggs. So I like lots of half height. It's a bit of a, I know, a conversation that tends their wage in the hallways. So the storage looks like this. Um, EMC is friends of ours, and they said, hey, would you like uh, some nice next-gen Clarion? I said, yes, please. So they sent me over a uh, VNX for this. This is the 7500 series, which has uh, three plus one data movers and a whole bunch of trays. We went with the two and a half inch height, uh, the little laptop size, 10K drives, which are extraordinary. Low power, quiet, 25 and a tray. We have lots of trays. And we, they gave us one tray of SSDs on top of that, which allows us to do the fast caching, which is very, very powerful. Not so much for our regular payloads, because these little data center uh, VM payloads go coming on and off the blade all the time, once a day or, or even less. But it's really powerful for the view desktops, because those are on all the time. And fast will start to sort of pluck the hot blocks of those up on the SSDs. And our view environment is just really snappy. Uh, when we get done with vCell now, we're going to melt its NetApp into the picture. And, and that is a little bit older, FAS 3140, that we'll upgrade to 10 gig E and we'll put inside the picture. So again, it's about multi-vendor. It's about having lots of different options and lots of different approaches under vCell. So what does the cloud look like? If we come up off the gear a little bit. It looks like this. It's all vSphere 5. And that was fun because, like I said, I started building this in February. And in February, vSphere 5 was, eh, eh, it was OK, eh, a couple issues. So we've revised that about three or four times as we went down the road. I have one VC for view. I have one VC for the core services that run the show. I'm going to show all this to you. Uh, two VCs for cloud capacity. Everything is backed by SQL. Of course, running at a VM. Like I said, everything that's hardware is running virtualization. Uh, we cluster with HADRS. We use a little bit of FT for uh, things like the vShield edges, or vShield managers, excuse me. Uh, 
using VCO uh, to automate common tasks, and we're really going to get into VCO a little later when it's time to start replicating catalogs around. Uh, and PowerCO Live has been a very, very useful tool for us. Uh, when we add, when you're working with this many blades and you want to add another 16 to the show, two or three PowerCLI scripts, and they are just, they're fully popped and ready to go. It's, it's very, very quick. Uh, Cloud Director 1.5, which uh, internally was known as Project Toledo. Toledo gives us a couple of interesting technologies. One is that we can now back it with SQL, so I do, running in a VM. And we can also use the Elastic PVDC, which I very much wanted, because it makes my counting easier. I can count in sets of 10,000, which is the practical limit for a virtual center. Uh, we have uh, three VCD cells that run on a common messaging bus, so it's essentially one VCD cell per VC plus one, which happens to be our recommendation if you read our uh, best practices for performance in uh, a vCloud director deployment, we say one cell per VC plus one. So I did. And vShield Manager 5, you couldn't go to town without a v VSM, so I used that. vShield Manager 5 gives me edges uh, for VCD, and we use it around the desktop, so I'll show you a graphic on that. And we uh, also use vShield App for creating zones around the desktop. That was Merlin's brilliance right there. And uh, we also leverage Endpoint for antivirus. We happen to already uh, have Trim Micro in the business, and so we leverage that. So we're using vShield everything to run vCell. All right. So what do the orgs look like? Working our way up the cloud here a little bit. This is essentially the whole thing. This is what the whole cloud looks like from an org point of view. Now, there's going to be lots of them. Let me point this out. Remember early on, minutes ago, when I was talking about service category A, B, and C, that guidance helped me through this entire project. I said, okay, what does a service category A look like? Well, everybody should have a wire internal. That's handy in case your VMs want to talk to each other. And everyone should have a wire that goes outside. Okay, that's handy. So what I did was when it was time to put this system online, we went to uh, TechOps. Uh, in VMware, we have kind of two houses of uh, IT. Uh, one is Corp IT, which kind of runs all the systems. It runs all of VMware, and that's where our HR systems are and everything like that. And we have another house that's called TechOps, which is kind of the IT arm of R&D in engineering. And they get to go do some other different interesting stuff. So we went to TechOps, and we say, we're going to go do this very weird thing out of giant piles of beta software. Um, would you guys help us build it? And they said, yes, absolutely. We want this experience. We want to know what it's like to put this sort of stuff online so you design it, and we'll build it. My analogy, maybe a Carmen Ghia, right? Carmen designed it, Volkswagen built it. Same idea. Very old reference. TechOps built this for me, and I said, okay, what I want is I want vCell to be like a big island of cloud in the middle of our data center, and I want it to have two drawbridges. One drawbridge leads to corporate, and we'll put some firewalls in front of that. One drawbridge leads to the internet, and we'll put some firewalls inside of that. So when you think about vCell from a network point of view, it is an island of cloud with two gates, with two guards, Juniper firewalls that sit in front of them. And because I have those two distinct points of access, I can then do this kind of stuff inside vCD. I can extend those back into the clouds, while this one here is extended to this cloud. So these folks here, while we trust our partners, don't really have any business going back to corporate, so they're going to ride this wire back out to the internet. So from their point of view, vCell looks like a big network cul-de-sac, one way in and one way out. From a category A's point of view, it looks like, well, sort of a cul-de-sac, one way in, which happens to be corporate, and one way back out. But this rides a different set of pipes. So I have this flexibility in VCD, and only in VCD, to do this. Service category C gets essentially the same treatment. From an org point of view, these two categories are effectively the same. What's different is their desktops, but from an org point of view. VShield Edge sit in front of these two wires. Everyone gets an internal wire. That's it. Easy. You read our reference architecture. This is it. That's how we say to do it. So I did. Lots to do. <laughs> I had this worded slightly differently. This is the tone down title of this slide. I am really excited, <clears throat> not just about vCell. My three favorite things to talk about in life my wife, my daughter, and my vCell. I'm really excited about vShield Manager because we use it like crazy to solve hard problems and create a secure environment inside of vCell. It is stunningly powerful. I hadn't really thought about it. You know, I work here. I've been here four and a half years. I was like, yeah, vShield Manager's great. I love it. It's great, right? And I talked to the security guys, and they're like, no, no, it's really good. You really, you know, it's really good. 
vShield Edge has to go out with a vCloud director install, right? Can't do one without the other. VCD requires it. So we put it online. What it does is secure not only the vApps that people put out, and they use them all the time, really, for natting, for uh, fencing, but we use it to secure our desktop lands as well to provide a firewall and a DHCP host. So I'm down one VM for, for DHCP services. Edge will do that for me. Great, turn off one VM. And it does firewall for me. Great, I'm out one piece of hardware. I don't have to deploy another physical hardware, on top, uh, physical firewall for that. Great, Edge does that. It was free. It was in the box. Fantastic. I'll use it. Deployed on demand, of course, by VCD to protect the orgs. And uh, the vApps can use them as well. And this is one of the things that's so cool about Edge. I have gonna, I'm going to have all kinds of folks in clouds in vCell that don't work here. <laughs> because that's part of our enablement. That's part of what we want to do with vCell. And then I'm going to make one or two of them org admins in their org, and I'm going to hand them their vShield Edge and say, this is yours. This is your firewall. Turn it off if you want to. I don't recommend it, but it's yours. To do that in the physical world would be incredibly expensive. We wouldn't do it. But with VCD, I can. I can have 25 partners with 25 clouds inside vCell right on top of everything else behind one of these little firewalls that cost me nothing because it got deployed anyway, and it's theirs. A feeling of empowerment there for the partners is fantastic. Ooh, lots to do. Uh, VCL app we use to protect, um, we create zones around the desktops. One of the reasons why I said the desktops are special compared to the orgs is because we'll have a set of desktops that's good for training, that are shaped a particular way from a security point of view, and another that are good for partners, shaped a different way from a particular security point of view, and a third set that actually is being used down at the VMworld booth. Uh, the booth is running on VCL next. So if you want to see it in practice, there it is. And Endpoint, of course, allows us to uh, uh, create uh, an antivirus. So all of our VMs uh, that are desktop VMs inside vCell Next are protected by Trend Micro. Uh, and it's all on the fly, and it's all off the wire, and all the amazing magic. Go see Trend Micro's booth. All right. This is what our view environment looks like. No, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it looks like if you're sitting on your iPad trying to hack it right now. I'm not going to give you all the answers. Uh, desktop C, sit behind a NAT and firewall and go out the internet side. Desktop realm B, which again have uh, app zones around them as well as an edge, go out the internet tap while the corporate tap leads to these that come up to service category A. Why? Because I have lots of users that fit service category A that sit at corporate. And to send them out the internet to come back in is kind of silly. So let's have them come in the corporate side. Who need to pick up speed? Everybody gets why Vue is awesome? High speed protocol. So I can offer VCD directly out the internet. In fact, I do. But it's, you know, okay, especially if you're over a cellular link, it's less than okay. What I can do is offer you a high speed protocol pipe via PC over IP, which is getting better, it seems, with every iteration via Vue. So we put Vue in front of vCell and say, if you need to do something important or fast or have fast access or you don't want to watch your mouse drag around, hop into the Vue desktop and go for it. Secure, reliable, pre-popped with great tools, access to either wire, depending on how you need to go out. Um, the Yottabyte stuff I'm going to talk about next. Anybody in the room ever heard the word Yottabyte? A couple of people, awesome. It's 10 with like 23 crazy zeros. It's a term like terabyte or petabyte. It's also a business that I got connected with through a friend who works at VMware. And he said, you know, you've been looking for a way to help people get stuff in and out of vCell easily without actually subscribing to some kind of cloud storage service, which is housed external, you know, to get things going. I said, well, I got some guys that might, you might want to look at. So what is Yottabyte? It's a virtual SAN technology. It's backed by whatever storage you might have. Runs in, in my world, a VM. They suggest, actually, hardware, but I said, what's that? Uh, it's a Swiss Army knife for storage access types. From my point of view, it is a web UI from outside vCell that allows you um, a cloud services of names you might already know where you can browse to the website and upload files in and out of your browser. It's that outside vCell. It offers dedupe based uh, in the core technology, so whatever you feed it, it goes through a dedupes. And it's how I allow people, it's, a, it's the easiest metaphor I could think of for people who have virtual appliances or sets of bits or installers or whatever, that they want to send through those firewalls and get inside vCell and give it to themselves. What we do is we offer it as a web UI outside. Inside, it's also a CFIS share, this exact same system. So we use a little login script to 
attach it to the virtual desktop that you log into when you jump into vCell. So you're going to get a high-speed protocol access to your view desktop. The Autobyte's going to self-attach as the Y drive, and anything you've put in through the web UI is sitting there waiting for you on your Y drive. So it's like vCell-based enterprise cloud stores. It's like following you around. And they can replicate among installs. So as vCell grows globally and we put more islands of this online, I can create this kind of backbone of storage that replicates and deduplicates itself around the globe that can provide this kind of spine of basic data that will follow around. So it follows those around. Very cool stuff. They don't have a booth. Uh, I don't think they're at the show. <laughs> I've only met them on the phone. But uh, the technology is pretty amazing stuff, so I want to give them a big shout-out. So, finally, well, I'm going to tell you how we did it. I'm going to tell you exactly how we did it. In order to do a vCell, not just a cloud, you can do cloud right now, download the products, go for it. vCell is that plus a little more. In order to do that, you have to know a couple of specific requirements that you have to kind of enable to allow for virtualization to run inside virtualization successfully. This slide will tell you how we did it. Now, there's some things that are too big to just, I'm not going to make you write down all the text in your notepad. <laughs> so in the speaker's notes of this slide deck, which will be available on our website after the show, are specific instructions for each step that you need to do to enable the nested virtualization support in vSphere 5 and vCloud Director in order to enable this technology. Some of these are already out in the wild. If you type in, you know, nested ESX, you'll get all kinds of guides about how to turn it on in vSphere. But what's not out in the wild yet is how to do it in vCloud Director. The speaker notes for this deck has that guidance. So what makes a vCell a vCell? In a Wonka-esque way, I say 99% cloud reference architecture 101. Read the reference architecture, do that. That is good cloud. 4% are secret sauce which, again, is in the speaker knows exactly how to do it, and 2% butterscotch ripple, because, you know, makes it a little bit sweet. What is the secret sauce? vSphere 5 is the first release that we have where nested virtualization is fully supported in the code base, not by cloud, I'm sorry, not by global support. If you call one in here VMware and say, hey, guys, how do I do that nested thing that Ford said? They're going to say, what? It's not supported by GSS, but it is supported by the technology. What they've done at vSphere 5 is actually made it really easy to run ESX inside of ESX because there's really just one switch that you have to turn on. There's one line that you have to put inside the VMX file that says, hi, hypervisor below me. I happen to also be a hypervisor, so treat me in a slightly special way. vSphere 5, if you go back to vSphere 4, it's a little more difficult. Again, you can Google that sort of stuff, but vSphere 5 is where it really starts. You need to enable a special mode inside of VCD. It's called ESX VM mode, and it's really very simple. There's a switch in there inside the API that you can call at. The instructions are in the speaker notes. Uh, and you need to do one other thing. You need to add in guest OS types that are ESX guests, because that is not in the database natively. So there's about three lines of SQL code that you need to say. Add this row to your SQL database. This is what an ESX4 server looks like. Add this row. This is what an ESX5 server looks like as a guest OS. And the third line says, enable this mode. That feature is in the product. It could go away at any time. It is unsupported. But it's in there. Then the last thing you have to do is prepare the hosts for use. VCD puts out an agent, right, that prepares the host mostly from a network point of view. And doing so turns on the mode inside of ESX that you want to support nested virtualization. So that step is actually done for you if you didn't do the step in VCD first. And the last thing you have to do is turn on promiscuous mode. For ESX to work successfully in a VM, it must be able to hear all the packets that are on that wire. So there is a particular step that you need to do. Uh, in VCD, you back uh, your VMs with a, a network pool or another. You need to enable that pool for promiscuous mode. You're going to get a lot of you know, duplicates and packet crunching and throwaways, and that's just part of the package. But uh, without promiscuous mode, your ESX server VMs won't work. They won't hear each other. So you turn that mode on. Instructions are in the speaker notes. VCell has brought us this. This is the third year in a row that VCell has been used as, well, not VCell, the VCell technology approach has been used as a platform to, for delivering the labs that you take. 2009 was the first year. It was based on Lab Manager. 2010 was the year we really blew it out. We ran 13 stacks of Lab Manager using a VCell type approach to deliver the labs. This year, it's this approach, the VCD approach that I was just telling you about exactly at grand scale. VCell is kind of the 
the experimentation area where we kind of noodle a lot of this store stuff out, and they, they built it at scale. Uh, it's being used for the VMworld booth. Hi, Pablo. How are you? Um, it's good stuff, yes? Love it. Great stuff. Uh, this is a picture of last year's. This year's looks just like it. It's very, very powerful technology. This is what this, all, this grand experiment has bought us. This is why the, v, uh, the uh, VCD and uh, the ESX developers spend time developing uh, nested virtualization for us. I have to skip through these because I want to do a little show and tell. Uh, the first w lessons learned from the original V cell that I wanted to apply to the new V cell um, everyone's leases are always too short. Leases are a way of saying you can use your stuff for this long, but then you need to clear the blade because someone else might be coming along. In the original V cell, we didn't have a lot of gear, so those leases were 12 hours. <laughs> you can put it on in the morning, and it's going to go away at night, and you can put it back on in the morning. Now they're seven days. Turn on Monday, and it'll be there still for you Friday. That's a better improvement. Leases are one of the biggest places you're going to have waste. If you have very long leases in your cloud and you let people run things for a month, they're just going to park on Blade and live there, and they're going to choke the place up, and no one else can turn anything else on. Put your leases low and extend them later if you want to. So it'll feel like a gift. Lower the barriers to access. Any client that can access your cloud is better than just one client. iPads can touch vCell, your Mac, your PC, your Linux server, because I have view in front of it. All of the view technologies are open, plus you can touch it with a native web browser. Uh, build for scale, the original vCell was 24 blades. We have 120 in play now, 150 something or other when we're done. So clearly built at scale, and that's just for North America. I'm going to build at least two more, maybe three globally. Uh, the last one, or the next one is uh, draw a straight line. So uh, Pablo, you guys might have noticed this. The more steps you have to go through to, to log into the cloud and then have a running thing that you want to work with, the fewer steps there, the better. You shouldn't have to hop through 40 steps and figure it out. What you want is, where do I go to press the green button and make it go to make the content work? This is one of the design approaches we want to have in vCell, very straight line between user and usable content. Uh, there's things that we don't know about this cloud yet. Uh, for example, the network backing, we're using VCDNI, which is the Mac and Mac encapsulation approach to back all of our uh, payloads. And we're not really exactly sure how that's going to go because half of those payloads are going to be ESX servers that are going to want to run Mac and Mac again. It actually works. We're not really sure how far that's going to take us, though. We'll see. Uh, and the last one was really a shout out for the devs. I gave a similar slide deck presentation to, like this to folks. Um, at their, at our engineering breakout uh, that we call radio, and I asked them to help me make ESX a better first-class guest. It is not an official guest OS. It really shouldn't be there, although it works beautifully. It's actually the best guest OS I've ever worked with. I can B-SOD a Windows machine in a VM pretty easily. It's pretty difficult to P-SOD ESX inside a VM. It's really very hard. It's very tolerant. So what does the future hold for us? Global deployments, definitely. We're going to hire up some staff in tech ops to support it 24-7. Uh, we're going to expand the service definitions. Merlin's helping me uh, grow that. Uh, there's lots of variants in the service category B space where a training room is different from a partner use, is different from a trade show. We're going to expand all that. And there's lots of other clouds being built within VMware. Hands-on Labs is a great example. That's a completely different cloud. We need to get in alignment with what those guys have. Uh, quick thanks out to my team. Hans, you really need to update your picture. <laughs> Online, wow. <laughs> um, Merlin and uh, Ray were my key developers uh, at the VCD layer. Lewis uh, runs the support team. Uh, Hans heads up my documentation and content team. Todd did the uh, view desktops. Mike Hazenkamp uh, was my first PM. Patrick Noya it was my second PM. Um, uh, Dino Cicerelli. Dino, are you in the room? You were here a minute ago. There he is. Um, was my sponsor. He's the one who called me up in February and said, um, can you do uh, VCL again? Yes. Uh, Drew Kramer runs TechOps, so it's his cloud that was, uh, he built my cloud for me. Ben Verghese represents uh, Steve Herod, our CTO in my group. And like I said, this is Carl's cloud. Would you like to see it? Yeah. Yay, I know. We have 10, 15, 12 minutes, 12 minutes. a ton I'm going to be able to show you that's very deep in, um, in just 10 minutes' time, but I'll try and give you the two-penny guided tour if I can. So as you know, this is a VCD-based cloud. So it is called the VMware Sales Enablement Cloud, and every single 
one right there, and you can see we didn't rebrand it because it's a VMware product and that's what we ship. So what we're doing is we're giving the field a VMware thing. Here's what it really looks like inside the box. No reason, no reason to change all that. I can show you inside here the number of orgs that we have. We have lots of different orgs for lots of different reasons. The orgs are mostly aligned along how our sales areas work. There's a west sales area, there's a central sales area, there's a south central, that kind of thing. Those are the primary sets of orgs. We have orgs aligned along our COEs, which are centers of excellence. That's what Dino drives. So we have cloud infrastructure management. That's what this cloud, uh, that's what this conversation is about. It's a SIM conversation. We have CAP and EUC. If you visit the booth, you'll see this, um, the booth um, kiosks are set up around SIM, CAP, and EUC. Uh, we also have a sort of catch-all corp org. If you don't fit into a sales region and you want to use vSale, you need to go somewhere. So I have a corp. Uh, we have one for education, federal, globals, Latin America. We also have ones set up for like partners. So we identify them this way, partner dash something, which helps us sort more easily, that kind of thing. We have orgs that are organized around specialists. Uh, VCOS specialists have a need to have access as an org admin to their own little amount of capacity, so they have the freedom to do things inside that environment, so we set up some specialist orgs as well. Uh, there's my three shells, like I said, two plus one. Uh, I have two provider VDCs, and the reason why I'm showing you these is, again, to highlight, if I can, for just a second. There's my two pay-as-you-go PVDCs. You can see they have three resource pools underneath them. So if I drill on this and go over to resource pools, you can see this is a new VCD 1.5 capability that I can take one provider VDC construct and put multiple resource pools behind it, which allows me to build scale out and scale up at the same time. That's new. It's very cool. Uh, I've got a handful of external nets defined. You can see here. I've got per VC a corporate wire and an internet wire. Why? Uh, because I wanted to spread my IP addressing around. I didn't want to have to have everybody draw from the same pool of IPs, so I set up a series of IP sets and gave two of those over to one VC and two to the next VC, and I have four total defined, so we can do all those sorts of things. But that's essentially it. All I have to do is tell the cloud there's a corporate wire and there's an internet wire. And then from the org network's point of view, I can simply deploy to the org. Should it load up? Should I have to reset? Should it not work in my demo? Moving on. Uh, there are three, uh, sorry, two types of uh, uh, network pools. As you know, you define org networks and then you back uh, an org VDC with a network pool. I have two types. I have a VLAN backed and I have VCD and I backed. And you can see why if I stretch that out. For the VCD and I one, I use, I turn on the prom mode so we can use uh, virtualized DSX. From the VLAN backed, I use those to back the org nets because I don't need promiscuous mode on an org net. That's just a regular everyday wire. So I set those up and back the orgs with those, and then I set up the VCD and I pool, which is very flexible, and I give that to the org and say, run your payloads inside this promiscuous enabled set. I can show you, there we go, and I will put this away. Oh, my cloud's busy this morning, good. Uh, so this is VC, and I will try, I'll just turn off task for a second. I will try to show you that here are my four VCs, as I described, and I put my laser pointer over here. And there's my view one, running view five in uh, vSphere 5. There's my core services one, running essentially the entire show. And those are my two capacity ones, and those are the three resource pools. Um, as you know, a, a cluster is resource pool zero, so there's no reason for me to put a resource pool inside the cluster. I just hand the whole cluster over. So there's cluster one, two, and three inside that PVDC, one, two, and three inside that PVDC, and a cluster for blades that are currently uncommitted. Because we're running the show off of this, there are no uncommitted blades. Pop this open, and there's your 16 blade set. And as you can see, uh, each of the orgs ends up with a resource pool inside of it, which is how it's organized from a resource point of view. With Elastic PVDCs, I do not have to go into each of these clusters and give the cluster a resource pool to represent an org. VCD does that by itself. I just say, use these three clusters, and as things get a little busy in one cluster, it hops over, builds a resource pool, and starts putting new payloads in the second one, and in the third one, and as you go. So it does a beautiful job of balancing all those out. My core services looks like this. I've got eight blades in there. I really only need about four, but since we're running the show on it, we doubled up. And in there, we run everything. Uh, AD DNS, uh, there's my chargeback server. There are my two, three SQL databases right there. They're you know a little beefy. They're a couple cores and 16 gigs of RAM. Runs like a champ. 
Uh, there's some old VMs I'm not using anymore. There's my load balancers that sit in front of VCD and also view. Uh, we're doing some monitoring here with VC Ops. You can see that guy is actually not running at the moment. There's Trend Micro that we have right there. It's running all of the uh, protection schemes for the desktops. We have a whole pile of utility type servers, things like DHCP and IPAM and uh, Splunk and all sorts of other things, all running in VMs. Uh, my VCs are all here. Um, I have an extra core uh, server in there for reasons that are too lengthy to describe. And my cloud director cells are in there. I have a couple older ones left over from an earlier iteration and my newer ones. Uh, my view runs entirely in there. Two connection brokers, two security servers, uh, because the corporate side connects directly at the connection broker side. The internet side connects at the security broker side. Uh, the view cloud is a completely different thing that runs in parallel to vCell. Go ask the EUC guys about view cloud. Uh, my VSMs are here. Every single VC gets a VSM because I have jobs for them to do everywhere, and there are the Autobyte uh, servers inside there. So that's the whole show. Last thing I want to show you, I think, so we have a little bit of time for QA, is chargeback. As you know, in our reference architecture, we call for chargeback to go out with every cloud. Why? Uh, because it's awesome. Also, because it allows you, now that you've measured your payloads and have a a way of encapsulating those in the form of a V app, you can now apply costing to them. We have chargeback running inside our environment. V demo is where Pablo's stuff is running right now, so I'm actually measuring your use. D did you notice how much of my cloud you're using? Um, you're at a million four, buddy. <sighs> Amen to that. So um, these numbers are out of the box, and we haven't done any tuning. Of course, I would never charge Pablo a million four, a million one, sure. Um, but you can see the real uses, and it's off the edge here, but you can see the real consumption, the real use of CPU and memory and so on for the VMs that he's consuming. Uh, this, I think, would be incredibly interesting for Pablo, who's in charge of the booth, to come back a month later after the show and say, so what did vCell find in the way of our consumption of cloud while we were using it at the booth? And I'd say, here's your chargeback report. In fact, just browse over the website and get it yourself. It's all yours. Fantastic stuff. Uh, I've got five minutes till the hour, so uh, let's do some Q&A. If anyone has any questions, there are mics here in the hallway or in the walkway. Come on up to a mic right here so I can hear you. Yeah, so as you were b building out vCell, did you consider using vBlock as your building block for the compute plus storage plus network? I see you're doing it kind of by hand. You considered using which one? Uh, uh, the the v vBlock, which has... Oh, uh, the vBlock. Well, you know, this happens to look a whole lot like a vBlock. Um, we considered, yes. We did very seriously consider the vBlock. And, and the, the thing about vBlock is that it's a very prescriptive set of very specific products. And I was getting some of the assembly of vCell at an amazing discount. So vBlock was pre-configured, and we already had some of the pieces. Okay. Yeah. And the room empties out. So I hope that's because you're nauseous yeah. from all the information. I got one more question. How do you uh, deal with uh, managing the catalog? How do we manage the catalog? Yeah. Like yeah. You... So we allow one org and one org only to publish a public catalog. And that is the dev org, which is where the people who are builders live. Where and you all provide other... the templates. Yeah. If I allowed more than that, then it would become chaos. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes, sir. What storage protocol we're using on the back end? All NFS all day long. 100%. Works like a champ. What do you do about uh, capacity planning or scheduling of capacity when you, uh, you know, uh, let this loose on a lot of people? That's tricky. In fact, it's an unsolved problem. Uh, CapIQ will help us a little bit. Yeah, but if, if I had a really serious, important project, I wanted to let loose on this. Yep. I wanted to be kind of guaranteed that I'm, my stuff runs. Yep. Of course, I have pools, but still, again, you have a lot of people. At the current state of the technology, my best answer for you if you came to me and said that was that let's throw some hardware at it so you get your guarantee. I have no good software way of projecting what that might do from a cloud impact point of view. It, it's a thorny problem. Yeah, stuff. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, previous solution was based on the lab manager. Yes, you bet. Did you have uh, to import any configurations from the lab manager into the new solution? Not a single one. You know why? Why? Because it's more effort than it's worth. You can build a fresh one given good building block pieces in the catalog than you can to take the one that you got, send it out into OVAs or OVFs, 
pull them over into the new storage of our own, pull them back in and stitch all the networking together, that's actually slower than just building a good one in our world, in our environment. So we're not going to port a single configuration over because we can build them in an hour. Well, if you, if you already have a configuration built by many people before, so it's yeah, you can save them. intellectual property, basically. Yeah, you can you definitely save them. What's, what gets lost is the network uh, relationship between the VMs, and if it's a complex network relationship, you're going to spend some time reconstructing that in VCD. But you can definitely save the VMs. We're not going to because it's just a bunch of ESX servers and VMs. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, how do you guys back up the uh, offline VApp catalog, including the VApp settings? We don't. Okay. And I'm not trying to be flippant. <coughs> I'm really not. But we don't. Um, there are technologies that allow for backup, but the amount of backup capacity required to backup, I mean, I've got seven or 8,000 VMs worth of capacity in North America alone on the, on the capacity side, on the payload side. Mm -hmm. To back all those up, we would spend millions and acres of disk to do it, and then if there was a failure, no one's going to want that stuff back. They're just going to build a new one in our world. What, do, you, do you know of a solution that actually backs up the VApp settings, though, and not just the images of the VMDKs? Uh, so I'm not, I'm not aware of that because I haven't done the drilling, but I would check with Acronis and Commvault and is there a third? There's two or three others that all offer VCD-oriented backup solutions, and they might be capturing that in metadata. Definitely check with them over at the Solutions okay. Exchange. Thanks. Tivoli, thank you. For vCenter Operations Enterprise... One of its features is monitoring hardware. Yeah. Do you have a list of hardware that you can virtualize as an appliance to be able to virtualize those things, or does vCenter Operations Enterprise still really need to provide it connections to Nexus switches and those sorts yeah. of things to see what it does? Yeah, the answer is yeah. It, it needs to be able to see the gear. We monitor our physical layer with uh, Spectrum, CA, I think, makes Spectrum. Does that sound right? Uh, so that's, that's what we already had in-house. And, yeah, there's a whole layer of, of gear monitoring that has to take place um, that's sort of divorced from cloud. If VCD Enterprise, or sorry, the VC Ops Enterprise can do that job for you, then, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I would monitor the gear natively, you know, directly. Okay. Does that answer your question? So if, if you're needing to lab vCenter Ops Enterprise in those connections, in those instances, you'll still need physical hardware to lab that. If you want to monitor that physical yeah. hardware, yeah. If you want to do, like, monitor a VNX, but you don't have a VNX, so you can get the VM, because uh, there's an appliance of VNX, for example, or F5, and there's others. So you can do that and make configurations out of, you know, make-believe gear that you can monitor. Yeah, that's doable. Yeah. Yes, sir? Um, at the orchestration layer, uh, for giving you elastic um, uh, hardware uh, capacity, what are you using within that uh, configuration? Are you mostly leveraging the scripts? Or are you leveraging um, remnants of your lab manager? Uh, mostly we're leveraging uh, Mr. Lewis Lamb, who sits and does clicky-clicky to help us out. Um, okay. But we want to get to a point where there's uh, essentially a, a battery of orchestrator scri scripts that say, take from this pile of uncommitted resources and add it to that resource pool, and it just orchestrates through and puts it into place. That, that's one of the automations we want to put online, yeah. Okay, so it's not, it's not there today? It is not there today. Okay. Uh, like I said, we haven't even launched the cloud yet. So, so that's all I've got. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time.